Hello, welcome everyone to tonight's meeting, um, Abolition, uh, Cultural Freedom, uh, in discussion with Mike Davis, Angela Davis, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, my name is Kienga Yamada Taylor. I'm a professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, um, and I'm going to help facilitate um, tonight's discussion, which comes at a critical uh, time. It seems like all times are, are, are critical times, but I think now uh, more than ever after the events of the summer of 2020, which showed the possibility of rebuilding uh, social and political movements to demand um, uh, and fight for the changes that we want in this society, uh, to the, the stagnation of those movements and the resurgence of the right exemplified by the events on January 6th um, in the aftermath of the presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, it always feels like we are at a crossroads of sorts, but I think that uh, the perilous condition that we find the planet in uh, with millions of acres on fire in the West, uh, with nearly 1 million dead in this country alone uh, from the uh, coronavirus, uh, with millions on the precipice of um, uh, eviction, uh, the crisis in capitalism, uh, the crisis in market economies, uh, and the failure of the political class and the economic elite in this country to offer any rational alternative continues to open up the space uh, for those of us who think a different kind of world is possible. And so I can't think of, I literally cannot think of three more uh, important people to have this conversation with. Uh, I'm going to very briefly uh, uh, introduce them um, because really, you know, in some ways they need no introduction at all. And we were going to jump into this uh, conversation over the next hour. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to have time for some questions, uh, but, you know, I encourage you to uh, absorb uh, as I am, the, the conversation that we're going to engage in um, tonight. So we have uh, Mike Davis, Angela Davis, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore to talk about um, what kind of world can we, uh, are we living in and, and what kind of world can we uh, hope to, uh, uh, to build um, in the struggles that surround us. So the first question I want to ask you guys, we were talking some about this before the meeting, um, how do you know each other? <laughs> when did you meet? How did how how did you guys come into touch with each other? Well, actually, Ruth and I were separated at birth. Uh, <laughs> I met Angela when she was. We were both joining the Communist Party, Southern California, about the same time. And she was teaching, or she was studying, or just finishing up studying with Herbert Marcuse at, at UCSD. And Ruthie, we met in what, the late 60s or no, in the 70s, right? I don't remember anymore. I would say the 80s, but maybe sooner than that. We met. <laughs> well, um, it seems to me that, um, Mike and Ruthie have 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 always been uh, um, central figures in um, efforts to bring about change, and therefore uh, among my closest comrades. Uh, and Mike, we have to talk about that period uh, because we've never talked about uh, the late '60s in in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I wrote I, I wrote an 800-page long book about it. Right, I know. No, I was going to say I've, I've been mostly influenced by your work. Uh, uh, I, the work that we we've done could not have happened without your contributions. Uh, so uh, I, I just feel so honored to have received this um, um, cultural freedom prize, the Lannan Cultural Freedom Prize, with the two of you. I well, have the prize to is. is I have to the prize is Angela great, but the said. great honor is being with the two of you, being with my I, heroes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I just want to echo echo what Angela said. You know, Mike, your encouragement and, and example really set me on uh, 
the path that that I embarked on that turned into me researching and writing Golden Gulag and doing many of the things that many people who are tuned in to us tonight might know me for. And of course, it wasn't you alone, but you have no idea how profoundly you influenced me, convincing me to be brave, to figure things out, to think harder, dig deeper, insist on a breadth of analysis. And I'm just really grateful that we became friends. You weren't just a, a, a model to me, but my dear, dear friend, close friend and comrade. And the same is true of Angela, who we, and we she and I met. 52 years ago in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, when I was a band, part of a band of black students who were organizing to take over the admissions office to make non-negotiable demands about our expectations for Swarthmore to desegregate that institution. And Angela happened through at that time, her sister was in school there as well, um, to give a talk for her old professor of philosophy from Brandeis, Dan Bennett. And Angela had a strategy session with us to talk about what we were going to demand. And she it made it very clear to us how clear our demands had to be, no matter what, because we had to fight <laughs> with vision. That's great. So I want to... Um maybe, you know, not quite start at the beginning, but I do think that uh, it's helpful when people who are sometimes looked at uh, as icons or, you know, as, as people who are assumed to have been on the left forever, um, to really unpack that and to talk about your own process of radicalization. We know that, you know, People who are political uh, <laughs> radicals, uh, socialists on the left, aren't born that way. And so what happened in your uh, path, in your journey through life, um, that compelled you to look at the world the way in the ways that you do? Ruthie, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, everything and everybody. I was born in the middle of the 20th century, smack in the middle, 1950. And I was raised by a father who was an organizer, labor and community. His father was an organizer, labor. Um, the church that I went to, and this is probably true also of, of, of Angela, um, was a central place uh, where people engaged in the black freedom mu movement you know, would constantly cross paths. There was a lot of informal education or maybe it was our real formal education going on. So that, that made me a fighter. There was no question in my mind, but that I would, be fight, would, would fight. I used to lie awake at night wondering what my purpose was in life, like night after night in a very crowded house of a very big and loving family. And um, I suppose it might be of interest to the audience to know that when I decided to become a communist was not because somebody from the CP talked to me or anything. It was because my geography textbook when I was 12 explained the variety of modes of production and communism made the most sense to me. So my friend Kathy and I decided to become communists. The rest is history, and that is why they're working so hard to censor education today. That's amazing. Angela, what about you? Well, you know, actually, I think I was probably born that way. <laughs> yeah, although you said we weren't. Uh, my, <laughs> my mother was active in the Southern Negro Youth Congress, uh, which was a formation that had been created um, uh, largely by black communists, uh, and I, um, I, I just, uh, I, I remember that uh, our our lives were imbued with this need for change. Uh, I think I, when I came out of the womb, it was uh, demanding change. Uh, um, uh, in our neighborhood, uh, there were Ku Klux Klan bombings. Um, 
I mean, I could, you know, talk about, uh, you know, what it meant to grow up under conditions of absolute segregation. Birmingham was the most segregated city in the country. Um, um, and, you know, later I remembered that my mother always used to tell us that things were not supposed to be that way. Mm. Uh, and, and so, you know, even though I went on to study critical theory, now I realize that my mother had this profound impact on us asking us to imagine a different world. Uh, so it meant that we had to both inhabit that, that, that world of white supremacy, uh, uh, but at the same time, inhabit another world of our imagination. Uh, mm. and, and not only of our imagination, because it was a world to be brought about through struggle. Um, um, and then later, when I went to high school in New York, I read the Communist Manifesto, and uh, it was uh, it, it it opened my eyes. And I, there was another friend of mine in my high school class, and we decided to start calling ourselves communists then after we read the <laughs> Communist Manifesto. Uh, and um, I joined uh, the Communist Party's youth organization when I think I was about 15 or 16 advanced in New York. Uh, and what's interesting is that I also uh, connect that, um, um, you might say, prise de conscience about communism with jazz. Mm. Because at the same time we were listening to John Coltrane, uh, you know, we were listening to Eddie Palmieri and um, Salsa in, in New York. Uh, um, the Cuban Revolution also happened around that time. Um, so it's a long story. It's a very long story. <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, Mike, what about you? Well, in the fall of 1964, I got expelled from Reed College after a few weeks. And I wasn't allowed to move back home by my parents. So I put on my watches and jumped the Greyhound bus and went to New York City to mm. work for SGS. I think I was probably the best collator SGS ever had. I was also great at mimeographing. What's a mimeograph? Uh, maybe the Smithsonian has one. But in any event, we'd sit around in the evenings and all these remarkable kids would talk about their grandmother who hid Lenin or their grandfather who, you know, had beat off the uh, the Black Hundreds and would co or been in the International Brigade and come around to me. And so what did your family do in the revolution? And I would go up and, because the only noteworthy thing I could think of that anybody in my family had ever done was my grandfather, Jack Ryan, a veteran of the Spanish-American War, had installed the first electric chair at the Ohio State Penitentiary. You can imagine how this went over <laughs> amongst, amongst my friends. About eight years ago, my older sister was dying, she's 16 years older, and I went up, took a sabbatical, went up to uh, Seattle by, the, by her bedside. And normally she never talked about family past at all, because my parents had broken up and remarried. There'd been a lot of stuff happened. My mother had particularly had an extremely bad experience uh, during the Depression, never got over it. They hitchhiked out to California. But anyway, I, I asked my sister, I said, well, you know, why didn't my dad ever try and go to college? And she said, oh, he did. He went to Ohio State, but they uh, threw him out after he went to that communist convention in Chicago. So at last, I, I don't know if that makes me a red diaper baby or a pink diaper <laughs> baby or what. But I have to say, I mean, growing up in a family where my father's two best friends were blacklisted communist butchers, where my cousins were African-American and Chinese. Mm -hmm. But above, but the, but the moment of, of when I saw the light, I was 16 years old, I was drinking heavily. I had to quit school because my father was sick and go to work for a semester. My best friend was trying to get me to join the Navy with him. I was really very screwed up. And my cousins invited me. This is 1963, the Congress of Racial Equality demonstration down, downtown. Mm. And that 
literally was my burning bush. I suddenly eclipsed everything else. I knew what I wanted to do in life. I wanted to be a rank and file fighter in the struggle for liberation and, and equality. I can't tell you how beautiful the civil rights movement was, mm. how it moved everyone's hearts mm. and how brave people were. Ordinary people, so courageous. And of course, Birmingham, uh, who was braver than the freedom movement uh, in the most you know, violent uh, racist city in the United States. Wow, thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you guys that um, that is just occurring to me uh, now is one of the through lines in uh, your work and, you know, I think also in your political experiences is California. And I'm wondering if, if maybe you guys could say something about um, how California figures into your um, political formation uh, trajectory, your ideas. Why is it is it's so why is it so important? Mike, you as you just said, you've just written an 800 page book um, about Southern California. Uh, Ruthia, of course, um, uh, has written, you know, wrote the the Golden Gulag about um, uh, prisons, the the, the buildup of prisons in uh, in California, um, and then uh, Angela uh, has had California as a home base returned from uh, Europe abroad to uh, Southern California, uh, was of course acquitted in Northern California, and then has been there. Sense. So I'm wondering if you guys could just say uh, something about uh, why California looms so largely in uh, in your work and political lives. You know, I mean, that's that's a really good question. And I think for me, so much of it started out as serendipity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just happened to move to California when I was in my mid 20s meaning I went to visit, met a guy and stayed, and I'm still with this guy 46 years later. Um, and then the second thing is that, well, this is what I thought about Los Angeles before I even knew Mike and knew his reading and before I had spent, you know, really systematic time thinking and as it were studying the place. And that is that Los Angeles is a place that had all of the contradictions on the surface. You just look around that city and you can see mm -hmm. everything always about to erupt or just after an eruption, no matter what, whether you're in a wealthy part of the city or a poor part of the city, industrial part of the city, you can see all these things. And it's, it was very hard for me not to try to make sense of what I saw through, you know, what I learned through my you know, political struggles on the East Coast, which is where I grew up, and uh, thinking through the kinds of lessons I got, again, to invoke my dad, Cortland Seymour Wilson, who was a labor organizer, a community organizer, and somebody who, um, although never a member of the Communist Party, uh, definitely uh, modeled for me the kind of uh, being in the world in which you would say to somebody, hello, I'm from the Communist Party and I'm here to help you solve your problems. Mm. But not, I, not a matter of I know the answer, but I'm here to help solve problems. So seeing the problems, seeing the contradictions and trying to work them out in a city that concentrates so much of the world in mm. its expanse. So I, I think those are some of the reasons why California for me. Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Mike speak last because he's the expert on California. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, um, when I was very young, um, a good um, portion of my family moved to California. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's um, sisters and two, two of my father's sisters and, one, and his brother 
uh, moved to California uh, because California was um, supposed to be uh, the, the the land of opportunity. It was a place uh, uh, where you did not have to um, worry about uh, paying for education. Uh, um, and as a child, I spent a, um, a good deal of time in California. We, um, we drove across country and California for me always, um, always symbolized possibility. Uh, uh, you know, regardless of the fact that uh, there are, you know, all of these um, enormous difficulties, but I'll just tell you um, a story that I don't often tell. My, my, uh, one of my father's sisters um, became very wealthy in Southern California. Um, she, um, it's a strange story. She was in real estate in Birmingham. She actually kind of, uh, uh, was a slumlord in Birmingham, moved to California, bought property, and uh, serendipitously ended up making lots and lots of money so that she bought these um, uh, mansions in in uh, Laurel Canyon in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a very bizarre story. Uh, uh, she once kicked me out of, out of her house when she <laughs> learned that I had joined the Communist Party. <laughs> So, um, but, um, but of course later, uh, because um, Herbert Marcuse, uh, with whom I had studied at Brandeis University, he was forced to um, retire there. They passed uh, some kind of regulation uh, forcing uh, professors to retire after the age of 65. And he went to the University of California, uh, San Diego, uh, and, and so that is why I ended up in, in, in California um, uh, in 1967, um, you know, after I had studied for a couple of years in Frankfurt. Uh, but, um, you know, I still think, I, I still have, you know, very ambivalent feelings about California. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, you, you know, particularly because of the prison work that we've done. Um, but at the same time, I I know that there's there there are formations that happen here that probably could not have come into being anywhere else. Uh, and I'm thinking about the fact that the you know the whole notion of people of color, women of color, is uh, is is something that emerged. Out of the particular, um, um, you know, socio-political, uh, uh, racial circumstances of California, so I, I, I still think of California as um, uh, as providing, you know, some kind of some kind of leadership. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm. That's great. Right. That's it's right. where I've lived longest, and I, I've chosen to live in California. I used to move every two years someplace else, but I've remained in, in, in California. Mike? Well, I think I grew up on Pluto <laughs> because um, I, I'm a different kind of Californian. When you tell people that you grew up in San Diego County, their first thought is, oh, you must be a surfer. You must have been one of those golden kids who, you know, lived in the endless summer, uh, at least until the Vietnam War came along. But I'm not. I grew up in a uh, blue-collar community, the uh, outer suburb of, uh, of San Diego. And if Los Angeles was the sun and San Diego was... I don't know what Mars. Uh, I grew up even even for their orientation was to the West, and so many of the kids I grew up with were from Oklahoma, Arkansas, but especially uh, uh, Texas. So I grew up thinking of myself as much of a Westerner as I did a mm. Californian. And in 1960, I had my first big fight with my dad because he was a uh, meat and potatoes union guy. And because my mom was Irish and Catholic, he was a big uh, Kennedy supporter. I didn't want Kennedy. And when Lyndon Johnson became the first presidential candidate ever to come to my hometown, I raced out the airport, broke through a security line and got my little pause question and the huge, you know, enormous hands of the man from Texas. 
about five years later, I'm in, <coughs> excuse me, I'm in New York City. I told this story to my SDS chums, and somebody watched, walks in the kitchen, pulls out a butcher knife, comes back and says, okay, cut that hand off now. <laughs> I think you know better. <coughs> but the kids I grew up with, I mean, they came with all the prejudices of white people from, uh, you know, the South, you know, the Southwest. It was not an integrated town. In fact, uh, El Cajon, I was born in Fontana, but I grew up in El Cajon, in an area near El Cajon. Uh, it was only when my cousins came to visit that El Cajon was integrated. Mm. But during the period, the two years I spent in CORE in San Diego, my girlfriend from West Texas, her father, this incredibly tough veteran of Guadalcanal and uh, uh, Cape Gloucester, became as fully active as I was. And even my hot rodding hoodlum friends, four or five of them, I got them to go to demonstrations. So although I hated the place, and, and dreamed of the moment I would turn 18 and could take the first Greyhound bus to New York City. I saw in the people around me, you know, all kinds of, of, of possibility amongst, you know, younger white working, working class people. Now I go back to where I grew up, uh, taking my Mexican son uh, to the East County. And it's an utterly closed society. It could be Mississippi in 1963. Uh, I went to see an ex-brother-in-law of mine who's a fireman, lives out in the country. Pulled up in his driveway and he says, running out, and he says, we're going to have to put a tarp over your car. I said, why? He says, that Black Lives Matter bumper sticker, they'll bomb me. You know, they'll, they'll kill you. You can't go out there. And during... Finally, during the uh, right after the election, I wrote a long art analysis of the election for the New Left Review, and I argued in it that a substantial minority of Trump voters were simply people voting for jobs, because given the choice between shutting down because of COVID and keeping mm -hmm. things open to work, which is the kind of Sophie's choice between your family's health and, and, and your income, but people voted for Trump. I have to confess, I'm not sure that that is the case. There's been no movement whatsoever away from Trump, except maybe amongst, uh, you know, wealthier white, uh, 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 you know, suburban mind. And I feel like I, I grew up and all my childhood associations are with a country that increasingly looks like the Fourth Reich. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to, so I want to ask another question about this period before we kind of transition to um, kind of contemporary questions. That's so, sort of where where Mike ended there, but I do want to ask about um, uh, this anniversary. Next year, uh, 2022, uh, will be the 50th anniversary, Angela, of your acquittal. Um, from uh, charges of conspiracy, kidnapping, uh, and murder um, in in 1972, and one of the things that I think is uh, under analyzed, under under understood, not talked about, uh, is the Free Angela Davis uh, movement, um, and I say that because when I really started to uh, look at this as a phenomenon of its own um, earlier in the summer, um, I was astounded by the size of the of the movement, which I think globally was something like 260 chapters uh, uh, around, around the world. Um, and Mike, in your book um, about LA, uh, you, you write about um, the, uh, uh, the, the movement there, um, to free Angela. And so my question is about, uh, from your own recollections of being politically active during that period, 
Um, and then Angela, of course, you were the 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 kind of focal point uh, of this campaign. Um, if you could talk about its significance um, as as something that the left can learn from, uh, as something that we should be studying and talking about uh, as one of the kinds of uh, social movements that emerge uh, from this period of the late 60s um, and early 1970s. I'll start, I'll start with you, Mike, actually. Well, first of all, uh, let me underline that I'm merely the co-author with right, John right, Wiener right. of uh, Set the Night on Farrell in the 60s. In 1974, I went to uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, kind of in the, the middle of the uh, of the of troubles, and continued to go back and forth until I finally married somebody from Belfast, and I have two Irish kids. And it must have been about the third night I was in the city, and a friend took me down to a pub, and there were a couple of young lads down there. Uh, they were obviously the kind of kids who would go out night after night. And then the next morning, you would read two IRA terrorists killed by the British Army or sent away for the rest of their, their lives. And these kids, you know, I was told, they, you know, they were the real thing. First question they asked me was, what about Angela Davis? What about the Black Panther Party? And Angela, I don't know if you know it, but at that time there's a big mural of you put up on the on the Falls Road because the Catholic working people in Belfast lived in what they called forever ghettos. They experienced much of the discrimination. They identified, unlike Irish, reactionary Irish Americans, they identified entirely with the struggle. Uh, in the United States, and the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland had been patterned after uh, the model of SNCC. But your picture was right up there uh, on, the, on the streets. This was a tremendous worldwide uh, 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 movement. And I anticipate that, I think that, you know, probably a lot of that kind of celebrity and stuff must at times been a burden to you, but it was a gift to people around the world to have a figure. I mean, Che was dead, but we have Angela Davis. <laughs> right. Ruthie, what was your experience as a yeah. teenager? Well, um, I, I have to um, put in context the, the shock of Angela's arrest and the subsequent trial in relation to other events that also draw, drew our lives together, even though we were living on separate coasts. And most notably, um, it was the COINTELPRO organized murder of my cousin John Huggins at UCLA in January of 1969 that um, made uh, in made absolutely brutally present once and for all that the kinds of international solidarity that people like my cousin and the members of the Black Panther Party, people like Angela and Mike and people in the Communist Party, people like Cabral and all of those people fighting in uh, for the liberation of Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde, people like those fighting for the liberation of Vietnam, all of those struggles were one thing, mm. that that is the moment when I went from piecing the things together and trying to hold them in resonance, I was 19, to seeing this is one thing, even if I couldn't talk about it very clearly. So that, my cousin's death blew a hole in my heart as it blew a hole in the hearts of our entire families and everybody who loved him. And it seemed almost inevitable that eventually somebody like Angela would also be grabbed by the system that it set out brutally to destroy all who had risen up against it. Mm. That said, 
the struggle to free Angela, which very beautifully uh, named the celebration we had of Angela's papers um, in -hmm. Cambridge a few years ago, Freed by the People, was yet again a reminder that the organization of organized people, including pop-up organizations, whether they were the chapters of Free Angela or something else, is the fundamental necessity for Mm -hmm. us collectively to survive, thrive, and flourish. And this is, for me, the lesson for us to drag through 50 years Mm. into this present and something that I think we can see happening today. It's remarkable. Angela. Wow. Um, Well, first of all, uh, Mike, um, you know, I have... have, um, wonderful memories of uh, Bernadette Devlin um, visiting me in my cell. And, um, and of course, later after I was released, I I made um, several trips to Northern Ireland. Uh, And, and Ruthie, of course, John was uh, one of my closest comrades. uh, And I'm still friends with Erica, his, his um, wife at that time. Um, uh, over 50 years later, as a matter of fact, we just saw each other two days ago. Uh, she was at my house two days ago. So, you know, there are these connections. Uh, but what I could say about the movement was, first of all, from where I stood, I felt like I really didn't deserve all of that attention. Uh, you know, when when I was in jail, I constantly thought about the fact that there were you know, all of these other women uh, uh, who uh, did not have access. Uh, so in a sense, you know, I felt, I guess, a kind of survivor's guilt or whatever whatever you might want to call it. Uh, and, and, um, and I couldn't, well, before the, before the end of the trial, I insisted that the name of the uh, movement be not only Freedom for Angela Davis, but free freedom, the National United Committee to free Angela Davis and all political prisoners. Um, so, um, but having said that, it was an incredible movement. Uh, and, you know, I got pictures, I got visits uh, uh, while I was in jail. Uh, and, you know, James Baldwin came to see me and he wrote this, uh, you know, wonderful uh, open letter that circulated, you know, all over the world. Um, and of course, it was at a moment when we had this vibrant internationalism. Mm. So everywhere there was a communist party, there was a movement. Uh, and to this day, whenever I visit countries for the very first time, I feel um, the need to thank people. I Just before the pandemic, uh, I visited Martinique for the first time. And of course, people came with all of the stories about their involvement in the campaign to free me. And not long uh, before that, I had been in Uruguay and people in Uruguay were, talk- were talking about that. Uh, so I think uh, for me, the, the lesson is that even though we don't have the same structures that we had at that time, the challenge is to create that kind of vibrant uh, internationalism. Uh, and today, of course, we have the technologies of communication that would enable connections uh, in ways that did not exist at all then. All of those, those, um, those connections were created largely through snail mail. Um, you know, and, and if we could do that with snail mail, we ought to be able to uh, figure out, you know, how to catch up with the technology, how to actually uh, begin to um, create the kind of movements that will bring people in Palestine uh, and people in Brazil and, and people who are struggling against police violence in, in France uh, and people who are struggling, struggling against police violence in South Africa together. I think that that is the major challenge of, of, of this moment. One other thing I will say, um, um, what, um, what really moved me was the fact that so many artists and musicians Mm. 
also got involved in the campaign, uh, songs uh, and images. Uh, and it uh, made me recognize then the power of, of, of art and, and cultural work. And I think now, during this era, uh, we're seeing this flourishing of, uh, of, of art and, and music uh, for social justice. Uh, um, but I, I'll end by saying, I, I said in the beginning that I felt I didn't deserve this uh, because I was just uh, one, one person out of the, the many who suffered the racist and repressive uh, 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 power of the state. Uh, and, and it took me a long time to uh, figure out how to disassociate that movement from me as an individual. Uh, uh, and, and, and there's a story I some, sometimes tell about this young woman I, I met who had a, a T-shirt with my image on it. And um, I, I, tend to, I, I, I tended to feel embarrassed when confronted with something like that. You know, I didn't know how to relate to it. So I asked her, I said, what, what, what are you doing with that T-shirt? And why do you have a T-shirt with my image on it? And she didn't know a lot about me. Uh, uh, she was a you know young woman in the foster system uh, who was trying to figure out how to go to college. Uh, and she said, whenever I wear this T-shirt, it makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel like I can do whatever I set my mind to do it. And at that moment, I realized that that the power of, of, of the campaign really had little to do with me. Um, as, a, as an individual, uh, uh, and that I had to begin to think about it uh, uh, differently. And it made me realize that the work that I've done over, over the years, uh, precisely because I have a, a, a different kind of uh, a platform based on the attention that came from that movement, that I have to continue to create that kind of uh, movement um, so that we can, um, you know, bring down racism, uh, racial capitalism, uh, so that we can demonstrate that the power of organized people uh, throughout the world. Well, one thing I think just, you know, reading about this secondarily is that it did seem uh, to introduce to a much broader audience uh, the problems of um, prisons, of policing, uh, of the the role of the state um, in uh, in in creating those uh, uh, conditions of vulnerability for uh, for black people, and then using the police uh, as a way to um, draw people into the system, uh, and so it does uh, coincide with a kind of um, what some have termed the the turn to punishment, and so I, I am wondering uh, for each of you, um, the the role of prisons uh, have been crucial uh, to your political influence, uh, certainly um, to your uh, political activism and work. Um, Mike, you were one of the the first people to use the term prison industrial. Uh, complex. Angela, you helped to popularize uh, uh, that term um, and also the, the politics of abolition. Um, and then Ruthie, you have been uh, such a formative presence in uh, what is now becoming a much broader audience uh, for um, the, the politics of uh, prison abolition. And so I'm wondering if you all could say something about uh, the ways that uh, prison and the the the, the criminal um, punishment or injustice system in this country, uh, why has that become or, or, or been a focal point uh, for your uh, political work? I'll start with you, Ruthie. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, I, I could sit and listen to Mike and Angela talk all evening and stay quiet, but I would like to share a couple of things. Um, the first is that 
In the late 80s, early 90s, when the entire planet was going through such huge fracturing and sea change with the um, collapse, slow but steady collapse of the Soviet Union, the you know disappearance of Second World for all of the problems it might have um, had meant that the last bulwark for freedom movement in the overdeveloped capitalist world was about to disappear. And also the bulwark um, that to some degree helped um, to protect uh, the capacity for self-determination in the um, uh, decolonizing world. All of that was going on. And we were organizing whatever issue had come up. Uh, again, at this point, I was living in Southern California. And it seemed to me and to some of us in the late 80s and early 90s, no matter what we talked to people about, this thing about prison would come up or thing about a court case or thing about, you know, it just kept coming up. So we might have been talking about access to education, prison came up. We might be talking about the ability to go pay your electric bill in a convenient way so your lights don't get turned off, prison came up. Environmental justice, prison came up, no matter what. And so it, it became clear that whatever it is we were going to do, that doing had to in some way um, involve this constantly expanding brutal threat to people's everyday lives. And given that in, in this period from the 70s into the, early, um, uh, into the early 90s, what existed of the weak welfare state was being very deliberately dismantled and um, made unavailable, whether for people's uh, security, health, education, and so forth, we saw rising in the interstices of those gaps, prison after prison after prison, police after police after police. And so to summarize where I got to, mass incarceration, not a term we used 30 some odd years ago, is class war. It is that capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. So that brings those two things together. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the third piece that fit in, because so many of the people who were doing the justice work, like Mother's Rock, who Mike introduced us to in the early 90s, um, were women and, and their children that if, as Wages for Housework taught me, if women do two thirds of the world's work for 5% of the income and 1% of the assets, then what we're struggling through and trying to struggle through criminalization is racism and sexism on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, we're back to internationalism, but dealing with the individualization of disorder, as my friend Alan Feldman put it, that um, materializes as arrest trial, conviction, punishment. Thank you. Angela. Well, um, how can I make this story uh, succinct? Um, I became involved in campaigns to free political prisoners uh, early on in my political trajectory. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I ended up going to jail myself as a result of involvement in uh, the campaign to free um, the soul George Jackson and, and the Soledad brothers. Uh, uh, so I have to admit that uh, during, the, during that period, I, 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 I wasn't thinking very deeply about uh, the um, prison as a, a repressive state apparatus and its uh, uh, links uh, to racial capitalism, uh, uh, and and I have to I have to uh, point out that it was um, it was people in prison who turned my attention uh, uh, to this larger question. Uh, uh, you know, after I got out of out, out of jail, I was uh, really interested in um, 
the situation of women in, in prison uh, because I had not, in all of the work that I had done around political prisoners and prisons, we had not really focused at all on women as as as, as subjects uh, there. Um, um, but first I wanted to point out that it was because of people like George Jackson and Ruchel McGee that I began to think more deeply about uh, the part uh, uh, played by um, state violence. Uh, uh, um, Ruchel McGee uh, was the first person I heard referring to himself and other uh, um, people in prison as slaves. Mm. And it was in conjunction with the 1871 um, uh, decision, um, Ruffin v. Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, where, um, of course, the term slaves of the state uh, uh, emerged, uh, that prisoners were actually equivalent to slaves of, of, of the state. Uh, so um, I... Um, I think a, a, a plethora of uh, circumstances uh, uh, led to uh, a, a focus on the relationship between uh, the institutions of the prison and the police and capitalism. Uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, anyone who's been active in black liberation movements uh, has always done work around people uh, uh, who have been uh, targeted by the police uh, mm -hmm. or or related uh, racist vigilantism. Uh, um, I can almost narrate the course of my own involvement by naming the cases uh, uh, we were um, in, involved in. And I was thinking about the other day because I, you know, we, we, we often call for um, prosecution of the police of the police officer. Uh, hmm within the context of the existing uh, uh, judicial system. Uh, and, and I was trying to ask myself, well, you know, why did we do this? Why didn't we realize uh, that we were actually using the, 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 the same system that produced through its own logic uh, these deaths to try to um, uh, uh, begin to find some justice? Uh, and I think it had to do with the fact that um, uh, we were considering a larger revolutionary um, struggles, that we didn't um, imagine that this uh, particular uh, capitalist uh, moment was going to last forever. And that as a matter of fact, in our own lifetimes, we would experience socialism. Uh, and because of course, you know, we saw what had happened in Cuba and the African liberation movements and so forth. Um, but, um, but I think that uh, over time, as a result of, of, of this plethora of, 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 of influences, many of us began to think more deeply about uh, the prison as not only as an, uh, as, as an ideological, um, 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 not only as I would say a repressive state apparatus, but also as an ideological state apparatus. Uh, uh, and, um, it's, I, I'm just amazed uh, that uh, that we are experiencing this moment. I don't, you know, Ruthie, uh, you know, we've been talking about these issues for how many years? <laughs> you know, and there was, there was like a little group of us. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly, mm -hmm. suddenly um, everyone is talking about them. So it, 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 it helps us to understand how um, ultimately, um, Movements can influence uh, uh, shifts in, in opinion and, 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 and ways in which the public uh, uh, um, embraces or does not embrace hegemonic ideas. It does prove that uh, what Gramsci said was correct. We can't actually create, you know, we can create um, counter hegemonic ideas that then uh, 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 begin to um, influence vast numbers of people. So I'm really excited because I never expected to be imagined to be living this moment. I imagined it, but I always kind of compare that to people who were enslaved imagining freedom. Uh, 
and struggling for freedom, even though they did not necessarily expect themselves to experience it. Uh, and, 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 and Ruthie and Mike have played such pivotal roles in bringing that message to uh, large numbers of people. So I wanna thank both of you and Kianga, uh, the younger person uh, <laughs> in this little coterie now. Thank you so much for your work as well, because you have enlightened people uh, you know, all over the country and the world. Well, thank you, Angela. Mike, what's your take? When you're a committed person and you live in a time and in a society with extreme state violence in the background, and if you yourself are not directly a victim of that violence, it's easy to take some way out from, you know, from the stress, from the moral burden, the emotional cost of that. I remember maybe it was late 1967, and I had worked full time in the war movement for a couple of years, but I wasn't at this point. And every morning you'd wake up and General Westmoreland would be saying 800 Viet Cong killed or 1,200 North Vietnamese killed. And you know who was being killed, you know, were farmers and students, you know, incredibly brave comrades of yours fighting, fighting for liberation. And I remember one day realizing that I'd gone almost a week and I hadn't thought about the Vietnamese. Same way with with prisons. The movement that Angela and Ruthie and others built has always been like pushing a boulder up to the top of Mount Everest and having it fall back against you. Okay. You know, defeat after defeat after defeat. My role has been incredibly minor and uh, episodic. One reason I haven't had the moral, probably don't have the moral stamina. But Ruthie and Angela have never taken a vacation, even for a single day. They've been fighting this fight regardless of the, of, of the defeats, regardless of the overwhelming uh, power of the state. So you see here, not only the role of movements, but a dedicated activist who, who fight through the, you know, the darkness of winter and in the coldest of times, keep that flame lit. I'd like to add one other thing. <coughs> uh, Ford's has just come out with a, uh, I'm sorry, I'll save that for later. Uh, yes, Ford's. <laughs> just come out on you know <laughs> you can see the old man here right uh <laughs> forbes has just come out with a list of the 400 richest americans it's jeff Bezos on top over the last year while covid was immiserating millions of americans their fortunes increased by four and a half trillion dollars. Okay. Let them keep a trillion and a half of that and take the other three and a half trillion, you know, and we'll have something of a social, uh, and we'll have the social safety net the progressives are fighting for. Another bit of recent news is that researchers from Northwestern University and the World Bank looked at 1,700 counties, about 70% of the population in the United States, and they looked at the jails and prisons in those counties and came to the conclusion that probably the single most important reason that American infection rates and American deaths are so much higher than, say, Western Europe is superincarceration. Okay, got 2.3 million people in prisons and jails. People in jails go in and out, 55% turnover uh, every, every week. In the prisons, uh, guards aren't required to wear masks in so many places. Only this week, a federal judge defeated or tried to overrule 
Governor Newsom, who's been supporting the prison, the correction union. Uh, so guards don't have to wear masks in prison. There are California prisons like uh, Corcoran and Avenal, where there have been over 3,000 cases. Half a million prisoners have gotten sick. Uh, and in large, they've been totally ignored. It's like an implicit death sentence that Democrats as well as Republicans have done. And of course, it turns prisons. I mean, nursing homes are the same thing. They were incredible incubators of, 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 of COVID. But at least now they have priority. People in nursing homes have priority for shots and so on. This is not at all the case with with prisoners. Goddamn Alabama is using its COVID relief money to build new prisons with, in which more people will die. The overcrowding, the lack of medical care, the you know, the brutality. And this is a case where it isn't just contained in the prison, but tens of thousands of people have died needlessly because the prison, because the infection pandemic has been allowed to uh, uh, run wild in in jails and in, in prisons. So we all need, I think, to struggle hard to recall every morning with 2.3 million Americans, their families, and millions of other people, you know, have gone through the experience of incarceration. To understand the pain they feel every day, the kind of torments they're subject to, and the absolute inhumanity. It's, it's become intolerable. And thank God there's a couple of people who've been the winter soldiers of, of, of this movement and kept it in front of the rest of us uh, to act about. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we're about at time, but I wanna ask this last question. I know there, there are a few specific questions that came from uh, the, the audience, but um, I'm gonna close out on, on uh, uh, a question that I, I, I think is, is important. Uh, and that is, um, this year is the uh, marks the 20th anniversary of uh, the first World Social Forum um, in Porto Alegre, uh, Brazil, um, in 2001. And Angela, you spoke some uh, about this earlier when talking about the significance of the Free Angela Davis movement, uh, which is about the power of internationalism. Um, and if there uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we can say is different about uh, the kind of broadly conceived U.S. left today um, compared to the period when you all came of age politically. Uh, to me, I think the most pronounced difference is uh, the politics of internationalism and seeing uh, our struggles as uh, linked with other people's struggles uh, outside of this country and really understanding the U.S. as the belly of the beast um, and feeling a particular uh, need for uh, American radicals, American revolutionaries um, to play a role in uh, political movements as, as a result of that. Um, and so I'm wondering if you all could just speak to uh, this kind of new generation of activists who are and organizers who are coming of age, uh, people who are uh, looking um, to ideas and politics and, and traditions uh, to mold themselves. And, you know, I think that is part of the reason why, you know, abolition politics have become so popular books about uh, racism and what it is and what do we do about it uh, have become uh, so popular is that people are searching for politics, frameworks, ideas, uh, for how to respond to uh, the multitude of crises that we face. Um, and I think one of those, uh, that, that politics that needs to be driven through is the, the, the importance of internationalism. Um, and so we've seen internationalism from the right, right? The way that Donald Trump uh, um, kind of, uh, 
part an, an American expression of uh, the the uh, budding fascist international um, uh, movement and the way that some of that coalesced uh, around uh, around him. Um, and you know, I think that the the virus has shown the ways that we are connected. The climate crisis have shown the ways that that we are connected. But we're talking about something more than just sharing a planet and being uh, connected, but about a political commitment uh, to the struggles of other uh, people and seeing our struggles as entwined. And so I'm wondering if, if each of you could just speak to um, the importance of internationalism in the, the building of a, a left movement um, in this country. Ruthie. Okay. Um, boy, I could talk about this all night. Um, absolutely vital. And uh, I'd like to maybe shift where you just left the question to a slightly different register. And that is, um, rather than think, uh, although it's important to think about uh, activists, seeing their struggle in somebody else's struggle. I'd like to uh, emphasize the fact that so many people are struggling across um, international borders, are struggling through time space in a variety of ways today, uh, which is to say that I think actually internationalism is alive, although it might not be called by that name. And lifting that up as we have managed collectively to make abolition into some kind of common sense is a good thing to do. And I'll give you some examples. One, as we know, many of the people who work in healthcare and do care work in general on the Earth's surface are often long distance migrants. So in the United States, for example, we know that a, a vast number of people who work as nurses who have been on the front line of the COVID struggle for many, many years are themselves or their children of long distance migrants, whether from the Philippines or from Sierra Leone or somewhere else. The National Nurses United is an organization that I've been doing some work with, Angela and I presented at their conference last year. I'll do it again next week. Um, talking with people who are part of the organized labor movement who are simultaneously working to democratize their union from within and stretch the solidarity across time space from the atomized sites of struggle, hospital by hospital, where union members uh, fight for good um, condition, working conditions, wages and protection, to their international reach through Global Nurses United that are in solidarity with nurses in Brazil and in West Africa and so forth. So that, that's an example, and there are many, many examples. There are examples as well, you mentioned the uh, World Social Forum, of people who have been working very, very hard over uh, many years to hold to account the various um, members of the investor classes, whether it's TIAA CREF, the you know, retirement account that most of us are somewhat dependent on, or Harvard University, or just big financial institutions that have been participating in land grabs throughout the world and displacing um, uh, uh, vulnerable people who work in agriculture from growing food that they and communities and, and people around the world need and converting land use to monocropping often for, for example, ethanol. So, you know, greening is not objectively always a good thing. So Maria uh, Luisa Mendonca, who was one of the founders of the World Social Forum, is today a leader in uh, the movement on a global scale to end land grabbing. So that's another example of internationalism. And I wanna say one more thing, because all of these struggles are part of what abolition is. That abolition, in my view, is not the absence of cops and prisons. It's the presence of everything we need to 
uh, secure that absence mm. and Sweet. renew and rehearse the world, rehearse and rehearse the world to make it. So the nurses do it, Vijay Prashad and the Tricontinental Institute built bridges between and among, um, uh, uh, for example, communist parties that might have had nothing to do with each other 40 years ago are now struggling together rather than against each other doctrinally in order to secure the capacity for people to engage in their own production, reproduction and social reproduction. And one last thing I want to say is that um, while the these latest um, you know, electronic capacities for co to communicate that's making this amazing conversation possible today are essential. There are also all kinds of more old fashioned, lower cost, lower intensity uh, forms of communication that my, my dear friend Elizabeth Robinson, the widow of the great, late, great Cedric Robinson has worked on again for many, many years all over the world. And that is community radio that enables people to be in contact with each other, low cost, low intensity, low energy, but the possibilities for building solidarity and building movement are really great. So those are just some examples of internationalism today that we can work from and with. Uh, thank you so much, Ruthie. Mike? I think that the um, progressive movement is responsible in many ways for abdicating uh, international issues to the established wing of the Democratic Party. You, if you take Biden as a weather vane, on the question of socioeconomic rights, women's right to choose. The influence of the movements has been a powerful win because he naturally would have tended to shift back to the center or the right in the last week or two under the kind of pressure he finds from not just Manchkin and, and Cinema or whatever her name is, but from the New York Times, from all the established democratic uh, institutions to, you know, cut the proposal in half, even though it's already been cut in half from what was initially. Mm. But the movements and the whole energy and momentum built up by Occupy Wall Street, by uh, Black Lives Matter, by the tremendous role, and I agree completely with Ruthie, that's vanguard role that's been played by, you know, nurses unions. But when the weather is about the state of the world, there's only a light breeze. And this was evident in the Sanders campaign. It was terrific on socioeconomic rights, on jobs uh, and equality. And although Bernie speaks out, you know, bravely at times about Cuba and uh, uh, about Israel. The movement as a whole has not made those uh, demands. So now we're in a situation where Biden is basically implementing crucial parts of the Trump agenda as foreign policy and military policy. This emerging Cold War with, with China is incredibly dangerous and serves nobody's interest. Uh, incredibly dangerous. Nuclear disarmament is a cause that's fallen totally by the wayside. You look on the border and these extraordinary scenes of the slave drivers whipping Haitian immigrants along the, uh, uh, the Rio Grande. Or you look at the military budget, the level of military spending. There is so many examples of this. And the left of the 60s and 70s had, you know, weaknesses. You know, it, it, it was wrong about some, some things, very, very much wrong. But the internationalism was real and it was at the core of most of the organizations in, in, 
and and movements. And I believe that socialists have the major responsibility to rectify this. I mean, if you read Marx, three things come across immediately. Even if it's just the communist manifesto. First of all, in struggles of the present, communists stand for the future. Right. In struggles of local struggles or national struggles, communists always represent the interests of workers across the world as a whole. And thirdly, communists always raise the question of property and economic power. I mean, Occupy Wall Street was great in in some ways, and it put income inequality right in the middle of the agenda, uh, which, you know, was a, a big achievement. But ultimately, that's not the issue. The issue is the power that the billionaires and the corporations have over the lives of everybody else. A power that requires, you know, let's break them up. Let's turn Amazon into a and Facebook on all of these into public utilities as <clears throat> old time socialists and even uh, middle class progressives were fighting for it, to, you know, at, at the beginning of the, of the century. Mm -hmm. But we will discover to our great cause that putting only domestic issues first, even though those issues are never fully domestic, given that such a large part of this country's lives are so intimately tied to their families abroad and that so many of them, you know, keep those families going with their remittances from this country. Uh, I mean, there are millions of Americans who live in two places at once. I mean, live in Pico Union in L.A. You know, the kids go to school in L.A. They work jobs in L.A. But they're also sending home the money it keeps a small family f farm intact. It allows somebody to go to college or train to be a nurse some, somewhere else in the world. So the, it, don't mind me putting this way, the objective basis at the level of people's fundamental interest for internationalism is stronger than ever. But the, the left, and I particularly fault the, um, <clears throat> the, the, um, part of the left that uh, can be day-to-day -day activists because of their trust funds or, uh, or will eventually in a year or two use their, their uh, Ivy League degrees to go back into uh, something, you know, you know, more lucrative. This is why it's such an, a wonderful thing to see the leading progressive women in Congress who are fighting that internationalist fight. Not all progressives are. <coughs> Thank you, Mike. Angela. Okay, well, Mike just referred to the progressive uh, women in Congress. Uh, so I want to, you know, talk about the fact that um, one of the uh, distinguishing um, characteristics of this era is the rise of women all over the world. And, and, and the emergence of a kind of feminism that uh, addresses uh, racism and capitalism, anti-capitalist, anti-racist um, feminism. Uh, um, and we're beginning to recognize um, that, um, that women who have almost always done the real work for movements um, should be acknowledged uh, as, as leaders. And one looks at the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, it was women uh, who um, created that movement. Um, and, um, you know, I was just thinking that we rarely refer to the fact that uh, 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 the Organizing Committee for Critical Resistance uh, and Mike and, and, and Ruthie and I were talking about that conference that took place in 1998, uh, where we were all present. The Organizing Committee consisted of 28 people um, and um, some 25 of them were either women or non-binary. Uh, 
And, and so it means that we have to, you know, think about uh, not only the role of women, but uh, a range of issues linked to um, feminism and how they are articulated uh, with these questions of, of, of state violence, police violence, uh, uh, um, prison violence, uh, the connection uh, between gender violence or intimate violence and state violence that has uh, emerged as a consequence of uh, women in prison uh, describing uh, uh, their experiences as being very similar uh, in terms of uh, being abused by intimate partners and being abused by representatives of the state. Uh, so I, I mentioned this in the context of your question on internationalism, uh, uh, because uh, this anti-capitalist, anti-racist uh, feminism is emerging all over the world. Uh, Brazil, for example, it was uh, Marielle Franco uh, who um, led the movement against police violence and insisted on a, a, a movement against racism, a movement against militarism as key to that campaign against uh, police violence. Uh, and in Brazil now, uh, Marielle, of course, was assassinated, uh, but um, there, there, there's a, a, a wonderful group of radical women in, in, in parliaments throughout Brazil now who are radical women, and they call themselves uh, the seeds of Marielle. Uh, um, and, I mean, I raise this uh, because also I think that um, when we speak of internationalism, uh, we should not... Um, simply be asking for support and solidarity for the movements that we in the U.S. are uh, developing and, and, and organizing. Uh, uh, of course, Black Lives Matter would never have emerged uh, in the way that it did without a solidarity emanating from every part of, of, of the planet. And I think one of the challenges uh, today is to create the kind of internationalism, and I love the old term, internationalism. I think we need to hold on to that. Uh, uh, in, 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 in the U.S., uh, recognizing how um, those gestures of internationalism can actually strengthen our movements. Uh, and, you know, I'm thinking about how in recent years our uh, developments, our relations with Palestine, our um, work against against the occupation of Palestine has really enriched our movements against police violence uh, and against prisons. Uh, and, and, and we've learned a great deal about carcerality, that it is not simply contained in these sites, that it migrates into communities. Uh, uh, and these are important lessons that are that, that can be learned only if we cultivate uh, uh, ties with people who are involved in, in similar struggles all over the globe. Um, and so I just, I, I, I really want to emphasize that because I think this is the key at this moment. If we're going to take advantage of this era and um, move in a forward direction, it has to be based um, the, the kind of anti-racist, anti-colonialist, anti-capitalist uh, internationalism. Amazing. Mike Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, thank you so much. I hope the rest of you have enjoyed this as much as I have. That's it. Take care. <laughs>